Hello everyone, it's Benny, and welcome back to Occlusion Cullen. Today, we're going to talk about one of the oldest and most successful approaches to occlusion culling, and that is portal-based occlusion culling. Oh man, does this technique have some history. It has been used everywhere from the earliest 3D games all the way up to games being created and released right now. This has really been around forever, and it has a lot of good things going for it. But, obviously, it's not a perfect approach. It definitely has its drawbacks, and we'll be talking about that. But, yeah, that's enough rambling. Let's just go ahead, let's get into it. So, imagine this is our scene, and we want to draw it. So, if we know nothing about occlusion culling, what we'd probably do is take the whole scene, stuff into one big, fat, static mesh. Say, okay, GPU, draw. And then the GPU does it. It's one draw call, super fast, super efficient, and the GPU handles everything, so it's amazing. Except you can't occlusion call a scene like that. Why? Well, because the whole thing's done in one draw call. It's not like you can s the occlusion calling algorithm can say, oh, don't draw these parts of the mesh. I mean, I guess theoretically you could, but you couldn't communicate that to the GPU in any efficient way. So, if you're doing occlusion culling, you're probably going to want to slice your scene up a little bit. And this immediately introduces a little bit of a trade-off, because if you have a really simple scene like this, then the extra draw calls and extra overhead probably makes this not worth it. But on the other hand, if you have this huge, sprawling scene, it goes just enormous. The artist spent months building it, has millions and millions of polygons in it. Yeah, you're probably going to want to slice that up a bit so you can uh, not draw most of that most of the time. So, yeah, there's a lot of trade-offs to this, and I'm going to talk more about that in a separate video, about what sort of scenes you would or wouldn't want to slice up, what techniques for slicing them up tend to work better, but having your scene divided into some form or fashion, some set of different pieces, is something you need if you're doing occlusion culling. So I'm just going to briefly go over two common techniques in this video, and if you want to know more in depth what tends to work with what scenes and what tends to not work with other scenes, look, check out that upcoming video. So for now, one technique that's very common is a grid. And you can probably already see how this works. This part of the mesh is in this part of the grid, this part of the mesh goes to this part of the grid, etc., etc. And then your occlusion culling algorithm can say, oh hey, these, the players here, the other three cells of the grid aren't visible, therefore don't draw them. It's pretty straightforward. There's a lot of parameterization and tuning going on for the grid, though, because, sure, this division seems to work okay, but how do you know this is the right division? How do you know, say, this division isn't better? It's much more fine-grained. You could do much more precise occlusion culling, but now your scene has a ridiculous number of draw calls to draw it, and it... Yeah, it's a definitely a little bit of an art, figuring out the best way to do this. But, grid, common way to do it, it's not a bad way to do it. It's definitely worth considering. And the other common way to, I'm going to talk about is dividing your scene into convex subsets. This would be something like this. This is a convex subset, this is a convex subset, this is a convex subset, etc., etc. And the advantage of doing it like this is a convex subset has a really delightful property. A convex mesh cannot occlude any part of itself. It is impossible. So that makes your math for doing occlusion culling a whole lot easier, because you can s sort of do occlusion culling just on these higher level convex subsets rather than on a per polygon basis, or anything else more refined than that. But the disadvantage is you don't have a lot of control over this. This can slice up your scene a ridiculous amount before everything's a convex subset. And it, yeah, it's definitely a bit finicky. Oh, and you probably generate these convex subsets with something like a KD tree, a BSP tree, something like that. Or really just any sort of division until everything's convex. That's, that's how it works. <laughs> but yeah, so those are a couple ways to do it. For the purpose of this video, I'm going to use the convex subdivision, just because it makes a really good example. But, again, you can use... there's a whole lot of techniques to this, and that's why I'm making a separate video on that. So, 
Now we've sliced up the scene into th these convex subsets, which are also called nodes in occlusion calling lingo. So I'm just going to label all the nodes, 1 through 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, just to have something to call them. And I should mention the terminology is not entirely consistent. Sometimes these are called different things, but I'm going to call them nodes just to have something to call them. <laughs> so yeah. So we have these nodes from our slicing up the mesh, and all these nodes are connected by these lines, also known as portals. Yeah. So this is where we get the idea of portal-based occlusion calling. And something to note is you don't necessarily have to use the portals that are generated automatically by a sliced up algorithm. It's also possible to have an artist manually place portals in a level, and that's not entirely uncommon. Especially if you have a big sprawling level, having artists manually place portals so that they know, hey, this is where portals should be, pretty common practice. But again, for this example, I'm just going to use the portals automatically generated by dividing it to convex subsets. So, now we have our portals, one way or another. How do we use these to do occlusion color? Well, let me show you. So, let's say our camera is right here, in node 2. And this is a view for us to, everything in this is what our camera can see. How do we determine what nodes are visible and what nodes are not visible. Well, here's what you do. First of all, you have to find what node the camera's in. So, this is a list of all of the nodes in the scene. It's out of order, I know. And we no find the camera's in node 2, so we can immediately mark node 2 as visible. Now, ideally, however you're storing the nodes, you'll also store a list of the portals that are connected to the node. So we should easily know that these two portals are connected to node 2. And what you do in portal-based occlusion culling is you'll check the portal against the camera's view frustum. So what you do for this portal, we can say it's entirely outside the view frustum, so we can ignore it. But if the portal's at least partially intersecting the view frustum, we process it. Now, in this case, the portal is entirely intersecting the view first. It goes all the way through it. So, we actually don't need to do any special processing in that case. If the portal goes entirely through the camera's view first, we don't need to do any special processing. We can just say, okay, we're good. But only after you process the view first, however that is, do you consider the node behind the portal. And that's the key to portal occlusion column. So now that we've processed the view frustum, or sorry, the portal, now we look at the node behind it, which in this case is node one. So node one, still in the view frustum, we can mark that as visible. But node one has a portal. How does this portal interact with the view frustum? Well, this portal only partially intersects the view frustum. It does not go all the way through this time. So in the case of a partial intersection, what you'll do is you'll reduce the view frustum to only big enough to see through the portal. And that looks a little something like this. So this is our new view frustum, only big enough to see through the portal. And that's great. So now that we've processed the view frustum to the portal, now we look at what's behind it, node 6. So node 6 is visible. We can mark that as visible. Now what? Well, node 6 has another portal. So we have to check that. This one is partially intersecting the view frustum. So we have to reduce the view frustum to only big enough to see through the portal. And there we go. So now we look behind it. Node 7 is visible. And Node 7 doesn't have any portals to it. So we're done. There we go. We're done. This is everything. We can mark the rest of the nodes as not visible or just ignore them or whatever. This is our set of visible nodes, 2, 1, 6, and 7, as found through portal occlusion calling. That's, that's how it works. That's all there is to it. So, how does this algorithm hold up? What's good about it? What's bad about it? When would you want to use this? And when might you want to maybe go for something else? Well, the strongest point that portal occlusion calling has in its favor is it is fast. Some of the earliest 3D games used this for 
really that very reason. It's a very, very fast way of doing occlusion culling. And also important, it has good accuracy. It's not a perfect way to do it, especially if you start having non-convex meshes. If I, sure, if I just add a layer here really quick. If I want to add a block right here and I didn't add any portals, this could start occluding a few things, like maybe this. Yeah, this is now occluding the portal from view, but I'm not going to pick up for, on that. So, you know, it's not a perfect algorithm, but it's a pretty good algorithm. And it's also not that hard to implement, at least compared to some other occlusion culling algorithms. <laughs> there are, you can go pretty nuts with some really complicated occlusion culling algorithms, but it is, comparatively speaking, this isn't that terrible to implement. So this is really the strongest points of portal occlusion culling. But there are some downsides to this. For one, this only works on static geometry. If you have a whole bunch of dynamic meshes, if your scene, say, is a bunch of cubes flying around in all sorts of different orientations and stuff, and you want to start culling stuff when a cube flies in your face, this isn't going to help with that. This only works with static stuff. At least, well, maybe there's a way to do it dynamically, but it's not how it's usually done. And it certainly would be more complicated than this. Also, this requires special pre-processing to generate the portals, and, or, if not, it requires extra work on your artist to decide what should or shouldn't be a portal, so that's, an that's another thing to consider. This makes your development a little bit more complicated, and that might not be something desirable. Also, you can only handle so many portals at once. If you want to divide up your scene really finely so you can get some good occlusion culling going, that's not exactly practical in this algorithm. You, you can only clip the, a camera view frustum to so many portals before it starts becoming a performance bottleneck. So, you know, that's, that's a limitation of this algorithm. This, there's a limit to how much occlusion culling this algorithm can realistically do. So, again, it's another a limitation of the algorithm. Also, not all scenes can really divide well into portals. This works well because it's something that might be an indoor scene, has hallways, has a big room, another hallway. Infamously, outdoor scenes do not lend themselves very well to portal occlusion culling because there's no oh, good candidates for what should or shouldn't be a portal. So this is... That's a pretty big limitation. If you want to do outdoor scenes, this is probably not the algorithm for you. You could still do it, but it would probably require a lot of division, and then you'd run into this other limitation, which is how many portals can you realistically handle per frame. And yeah, so this algorithm has some definitely non-negligible drawbacks to it. But if you happen to have a scene where this would work really well for you, hey, go for it. It's been around forever for a reason. This is a really good way to do occlusion culling. It's just, it also comes with some significant disadvantages to it. But does it really need to have this many disadvantages? You know, perhaps there'd be some ways you could take the same general concept and maybe apply it a little bit differently to overcome some of these limitations. How might you do something like that? Find out next time. I hope you enjoyed, I hope you learned, and I'll see you in the next video.